Well, how do there, daylight burners? Ah, uh, how the hell's it going? Happy Friday. Uh, apologize for the bull session this week. Um, had a couple different options lined up and nothing worked. So, anyhow, it's all right. It happens like that. And um, I got a pretty cool episode for you. It's a little continuation of my first history podcast that I did, if you remember way back to uh, pre-COVID times, I believe. Pre-COVID. I don't know. Um, when did COVID start? March, and it is now September. It's like just 9,000 years of spring and summer that we've had to deal with, it seems like. Um, but anyway, I believe it was pre-COVID time, and I did one... Uh, First first history episode on Blackjack Ketchum. Well, this is going to be a little spin-off episode of that, and I think you're going to like it because I enjoyed it. So, um hopefully I can uh convince you that it's a pretty in interesting story. So, uh before we get into this about the Battle of Turkey Creek Canyon, uh tell you about the people that helped put all this together. And uh, keeps my jackass on the air. So, first off, we got Stetson Ranches. You know them, you love them, and you should know them and love them harder. Because they're the best out there. Uh, Multi-generational uh, family ranch. Working to build something sustainable for many generations to come. And sustainable in an economic sense, in a, a true environmental sense. And um, just good people. Uh, bringing you the best products they can possibly give you, and uh, uh, you know they got they got industrial hemp, getting way ahead of the curve on that deal to, um, you know just they're, they're early adopters. That's going to be a, a cash crop uh, for for many years down the road, and it's awesome. They're they're in uh, they're in on it already, so it's uh, it's a good deal. Uh, they got some of the best. Uh, quarter horses that money can buy. They got uh, old foundation quarter horse lines, uh, Zanpar Bar, Two Eyed Jack, Peppy Sam Badger, all on their papers. Just really nice mares that they're uh, they're breeding. They got a uh, big, soggy, uh, you know, heavy boned, athletic, and uh, and best of all, just mares with a good mind. They're spitting out really nice babies, and uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a better. Uh, Better remuda out there than uh, than Stetson Ranches, and then finally I got the cornerstone of the whole operation. They got the the box beef program, uh, direct to consumer, meaning that you buy an animal and you get that same animal animal delivered to your door, guaranteed prime, uh, coming from uh, you know registered Angus cows, uh, sired by registered Hereford bulls, spitting out F1 black baldy cross calves. Graden Prime, uh, getting cut and wrapped to your liking, delivered to your door, and all for about six ninety five a pound, uh, which is about the same price as hamburger in the store nowadays. Uh, but this, you're not getting hamburger and, uh, and and just hamburger. You're getting hamburger. You're getting steaks. You're getting roast. You're getting everything good that comes off the the, the beef cow. And it's coming to your door, and you know who raised it, you know what it was fed, and you know the people uh, are taking the best best care of the, the animal to, to bring you the best quality product. So, uh, you've got any questions about Stetson Ranches in, in any aspect, just shoot me a message over at burningdaylight.com, or uh, at, at the Facebook page, sorry. Burning Daylight on Facebook, um, we'll, we'll get you set up. Uh, next up, we got Loma Livestock. You know George; he's running the best goddamn sale barn in North America. Every Friday, sale there in Loma at thirteen sixty nine twelve and a half Road, starting at ten a.m. Mountain Time, and um, just a great, great little sale barn they got there. Like I said, best in North America. Uh, George is doing things right. He's uh, looking into the future, reading his tea leaves, and his tea leaves are saying that. We got to use this technology to bring some more value to the bottom line for the producer, and that's what he's trying to do. And um, he he's way ahead of the game. Great guy, great operation he's got going on. You can't make it to the sale on Fridays. Um, 
Well, I guess we'll forgive you, but that's only because go over to dvauction.com. Click on the Loma Livestock tab. You can uh, watch the sale live, and you can bid on it live right there. Uh, and you don't even have to leave your couch. You don't even have to put pants on. But we prefer that you do. Loma Livestock prefers that you, you do. And um, But that's, that's your call. You're an adult. Make your own decision. Um, you got any other questions, give them a holler, 970-858-9988, or check them out online, LomaLivestock.com. Uh, finally, we got Mr. Nick Allen Loot. Uh, braided rawhide services custom braided uh, either hondas bozels quartz romel reigns he does it all uh, and he's pretty damn good at it uh, he's making stuff for the working cowboy because he is a working cowboy and and he happens to be just really damn talented you uh you want to check out any of his work or uh, get in touch with him uh, find him on facebook nick allen luke l-u-t-e and over on Instagram at Will Cowboy for Food. Uh, and with all these sponsors, let them know uh, if you get in contact with them. Let them know Burning Daylight sent you. So, all right, uh, we got a we got a good one coming tonight. I think you'll like it. Oh, man, it is fucking hot in here. Ah. Uh. I did uh, not a whole lot of research, but I basically rewrote an article that I read, but I would put it in my own words. So if I say that out loud right now and admit it up front, does that that's that can't be plagiarized, right? So, um, but just in case, uh, I found this article. Um. Uh, from True West Magazine. And it was wrote by um weird Bob Bose Bell, B O Z E. So Bob Bose Bell wrote this article and that's where I got most of my my information from. And um and I I think it was legends of the old west.com where I, I, I pulled a couple couple other things from. But this, like I said, is a spin-off of the Blackjack Ketchum episode. Um if you remember, Blackjack Ketchum was one of the more interesting uh Old West outlaws that you probably never heard of. And, and this is another really interesting uh saga that spun off from there because uh let me take you back so catch em gang uh started in texas uh eventually they they were wanted for murder in texas so they moved over into new mexico which was still just territory uh and they were you know if you kept your shit kind of small time uh you could probably get away with quite a bit because they were still dealing with uh, with Indian raids and uh, Mexican bandits. You know, they, they had a lot of shit going on in New Mexico territory. Uh, the, the army that was in New Mexico territory did not want to be in New Mexico territory because it was desert and and it was hard, hard living, and they hated it. And... Um, New Mexico Territory was kind of the red-headed stepchild of the United States at the at that point in time. Um, maybe just one step uh, on the rung above uh, Utah, which you know they had the, the peculiar institution uh, which they were they were shutting down. So um, this was back in 1897. It's the last uh, instance I could find where the whole Ketchum gang was together. Because if you remember, uh, they were having a lot of luck uh, robbing these trains there in uh, northeast New Mexico, right around Folsom, uh, Clayton, uh, Cimarron, Tucumcari area. You know, it's a uh, lot of lot of nothing out there, but there's a lot of lot of canyons and shit and. And there was, uh, you know, town space pretty evenly, so it was, uh, there was a lot of places to hide. 
And it was a good, good place to rob a train. So they had a lot of luck. And uh, on September 3rd, 1897, uh, old Blackjack and his gang, they, uh, they head up to this train just, out, uh, just outside of Folsom. There's a train leaving Folsom headed to Cimarron. They uh, they stop it and they they do what they always do. They un unhook one of the cars and then they send the rest of the train on their way, and uh, and they just leave that car right there. They they loot it. They get all the the cash and whatnot, and then they light out for the hills. And that's exactly what happened here. And they they took a pretty good chunk of money. It says about twenty thousand dollars in gold, and about forty thousand dollars in silver. So in today's terms, you're talking about at least a gazillion. Um, look it up. Check my numbers. You'll know I'm right. Uh, so they had a pretty good haul. But this is also right about the time where um, Sam Ketchum, who's actually the oldest Ketchum brother, and uh, Depends on which source you're reading. Uh, most of the time they called him Will Carver. Uh, a couple cases called him Bill Carver. Either way, he was a well-known member of uh, the Wild Bunch, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kids uh, gang. But he also, he also uh, spent some time with the Ketchums, as well as the Ketchums spent some time with the Wild Bunch. You know, it was kind of like... Uh, you had like the North All Stars in the in the Wild Bunch, and then you had like the South All uh, All Stars with the the Ketchum Bunch, but they weren't really fighting or they weren't really competing against each other, and so sometimes they just like gang up and um, go wild, and they you know compete against the you know local banks and trains and whatnot, and they just have a good old time, and then you know then they'd split up, go their own ways. Um, but anyway, that's kind of what happened here. So they, like I said, this is the last last case I could I could find where uh, it was the full Ketchum gang that did this robbery. So they got about sixty grand uh, in coin, and somewhere along the way, somebody gets butt hurt about how it's going to get split up. Uh, who knows what the argument was? Whether um, you know. They, uh, maybe old Blackjack's horse stumbled and, uh, he was late getting to the car and by the time he got there, the work had all been done. Even though this is his gang, uh, he really didn't put in his, uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't hold up his end of the bargain, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't carrying his weight, so why should he get so much? And he says, well, because I'm the leader, motherfucker. And, uh, they said, well, no, fuck you, guy. And they said, don't call me guy, pal. They uh, don't call me pal, buddy. And he said, I'm not your buddy, pal. And uh, next thing you know, uh, old Sam, his own brother, older brother, Will Carver, and uh, LZ Lay is his name, uh, also known as William McGinnis, old slick Willie McGinnis. And uh, they head off and they do their own thing. So they've got this, uh, they've got this whole train robbery down just about to a science at this point like they they're getting really good at it everybody knows it's them but they uh they they know how to get this shit done and and they keep uh being successful at it because they pick the right trains and and then they space out their their robbery so they're not expecting it every single time you know they're they're kind of on the edge but if you wait long enough you know well they, they get a little complacent and that's when they come riding in so July 11th, 1899, not real, I'm not real for sure on the timeline from here, but it says, uh, July 11th, 1899, uh, Sam Ketchum, Will Carver, and, uh, Elsie Lay, they rob a train at Dry Gulch, which, uh, is between, like I said, between Folsom and, uh, and Cimarron. And they uh, they make away with fifty thousand bucks, pretty damn good haul. And there's only three of them this time to split it up, so I'm sure they're just tickled to beat the band. Um, but you know it's it's not a very not a very long haul from from there to Cimarron. Uh, word gets to uh, gets to Cimarron that hey we got robbed and they they got a fuckload of money. So posse is scrambled together 
and uh, away they go. Fast forward about a week later is when uh, Black Jack Ketchum makes his infamous final train robbery and uh, gets shot and then uh, and afterwards hung twice. Uh, popped its head off. But July 11th, uh, they they make off with this money. Posse is getting assembled, and um, the Kang they uh, they hide or they they hightail it back to their normal hangout there uh, at Turkey Creek Canyon, which is right right kind of by Cimarron. So this is where they'd been they'd been holing up after all these train robberies they've been uh, committing. Um. But they were in pretty good with the local population, so nobody really ratted him out until this time. So they must uh they must have done something to lose favor with uh you know the general population because um ex you know, Snitch has given up uh their location there on Turkey Creek Canyon. And um Yeah, you know that old story Snitches get snitches. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about that later on towards the end of the episode. Um, so anyhow, Sheriff Edward Farr, couldn't find much on this guy. Uh, one of his deputies, it says lawman. I couldn't find if he was a deputy or a marshal of some sort. But anyway, he was, uh, he was second in command, Wilson Memphis Elliott. I don't know why he was named Memphis. I'm not sure. Memphis, Tennessee or Memphis, Texas, whatever the... Whatever the case may be. And then, third guy that I read about in this posse. Best name ever. Hands down. Coolest fucking name of all time. Perfecto Cordoba. Perfecto Cordoba. Awesome name. Um, that's about all I know about Mr. Cordoba. Uh, next, we got William Reno, Frank Smith, Henry M. Love. Uh, he has a bad time. Real bad. And uh, James H. Morgan. Now, they uh, they saddle up and they head out. And uh, they must have rode up on these fellas, you know, kind of late afternoon, early evening. But they, they see, their, see the smoke from their campfire. They ride on up. And... Uh, they're looking down on this uh, this dry creek bed. So it's Turkey Creek, Turkey Creek, however you want to call it. We say creek down there, but um, Turkey Creek Creek is kind of a kind of like a lot of rivers around there. It's there. There's dry river beds. Uh, the water's under goes underground right there, and this is this is no uh, no exception here. And uh, they they split up and so they they send four of these four of these guys go up the north side of the creek bed uh and then the other three head over on the west side as this creek's uh you know winding through there and they uh they get dug in up on this uh this little bluff and uh so then they're waiting and Mr. Elsie Lay, old slick Willie McGinnis uh, I don't know if he, uh, it doesn't say, like I said, it wasn't real clear on the timeline. It says that there was, uh, it was five days from when they, they pulled off their train robbery to when all this shit goes down. But I don't know what happened in between there. Not a very, not a very far ride from, uh, from Folsom to Cimarron. To drive it now, uh, is about an hour. Uh, back in those days, you could kind of ride as the crow flies, follow the creek, follow the creek. And, uh, you know, and you could probably get there in a day or two. So, anyhow, this this hideout is somewhere outside of uh, a Cimarron. Don't know how long they've been there. Uh, doesn't say anything about them receiving any sort of injury when they pulled off this heist. So... My assumption is they they get to their hideout. They uh they maybe have some some booze stored up there and they're they're thinking they're pretty safe. And uh they get a little boozed up and uh this posse rides up on them. 
They split up. They've got them covered on both sides. And old LZ Lay, Slick Willie, uh, has got to go drain the old Slick Willie. And, uh, and also, in the meantime, he's got to get some water to, to refill. They've been just, you know, boozing hard for a couple of days. Because they, they got $50,000 that they, they only got to split three ways. So, hell of a deal. Hell of a deal. So, these old boys see, uh, see LZ Slick Willie, uh, McGinnis Lay. A lot, of, a lot of aliases back in the old west, you come to find out. Uh, so, doesn't say uh, whether they, they warned this guy to put his hands up or whatever. Uh, but shooting starts, and uh, they hit old poor LZ Lay uh, in the shoulder and the chest, and he just drops like a rock, as they said. Uh, just like somebody hit him with a, with a club in the back of the head, and he just dropped straight down. They thought he's dead. Well, he's not. Well, that'll, that'll come back into play later. Um, so then... Uh, Oh, Memphis Elliot. This is, uh, it's kind of debatable, uh, depending on who you listen to, but either the sheriff or his, uh, deputy slash co lawman. I don't know what his actual title was. Uh, but he, <clears throat> one, one of those two started shooting, probably both of them, but a after they drop old Elsie, then uh, Memphis, he he uh, notices the these outlaws' horses tied up. So he takes a couple pot shots at them, drops one horse, possibly wounds another. Not real for sure. And then, as there uh, as this is all happening up, uh, you know the two people down on down uh, at the campfire, old Carver and Sam Ketchum. Uh, oh, perfecto, perfecto. He's watching down there, and he sees two of them, and then the shooting starts, and uh, next thing you know, old Sam is kind of a dum-dum. He comes running right in, um, instead of trying to take cover over by where he's at, he comes running towards the shooting, and uh, kind of freaks him out. So, might have been a good move, but also, I think... Oh, Sam Ketchum just kind of liked the fight, and he was not all that bright. Anyway, so he he starts he starts uh, trading rounds with the, with the sheriff. Old Memphis is shooting horses over there, and the next thing you know, Carver he finds himself a little sniper's nest, and uh, he's he's up above everybody, and he's also using smokeless powder. These uh. These people in the posse were not. They were using black powder. And the smoke and the, you know, and the flame from, from their, uh, every time they shoot is giving away their position where this guy is using smokeless powder. And it's dark at this point. And nobody can see shit. And they, uh, you know, they just, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's late afternoon, so it's kind of like that, that really shitty time of day because it's still kind of light out, but not. Shadows are real, you know, real crazy. And, uh, you know, every time one of these posse guys shoots, they've you know, got a flame belching out the barrel of their gun. Gives away their position. And then old Carver, he's just sitting up there on, on his little bluff with a bunch of scrub brush in front of him. They can't see him, and he's just picking them off. Just boom, boom, boom. And uh, in the meantime, old Sam, he comes charging in. And he starts uh, he starts shooting at old Memphis and the sheriff. And, and then he's just talking shit to him the whole time. Because, you know, they got, a, they got fire coming from two different directions. In the meantime, old Elsie's just laying in his blood. And, uh, and Sam's just like, yeah, come get some, motherfucker. Come get me. Come get me, and Carver's just starts spraying, spraying rounds in everywhere. But um, everybody kind of zeroes in on on old Sam because apparently he wasn't uh, using smokeless uh, smokeless powder. 
and uh, they just start pouring it to him, and eventually somebody hits him in the in the left arm, breaks his arm just right below the shoulder. And so he goes down, he's out, and uh, and then old LZ Lay is still just laying in the pool of his own blood. So it's just Carver, and uh, none of these posse guys know where the fuck he's at. I mean, they, they don't know anything. So he starts just spraying everywhere, but he's not really spraying. Apparently this guy's a pretty damn good shot. So he hits uh, Mr. Smith in the calf, and... Uh, and then after after Sam goes down, like he just you know Will Carver just keeps on pouring it to him, and uh, he finds uh, you know they must have been hollering orders back and forth, and uh, old Sheriff Farr is making a bunch of noise, and he must have kind of singled him out, and old Farr pokes his head around the corner to see what's going on, and. Uh, and old Carver sends one down range and ends up skinning his wrist up. And uh, he, he ducks back around the tree and he, he goes yelling over to to Mr. Reno. And he says, hey, where's that shot coming from? And at that same time, another bullet hits the tree, goes through the tree and hits old, uh, hits old Sheriff Farr right in the chest. <coughs> and um, I've read a couple of different accounts. Um... One seems a little uh, too far-fetched, uh, as that Mr. LZ Lay uh, all of a sudden comes back to consciousness, comes back to life, and uh, and he sees uh, he sees this old sheriff there, and he pulls up his gun and shoots and shoots through the tree, and and hits the sheriff and and kills him. Uh, most historians, it seems like, uh, discount that as a myth, and they say that, uh, Carver shot him both times. But anyhow, he gets shot, bullet hits a tree, goes through the tree, hits him in the chest, and he dies right on top of Mr. Smith, who is, must be really grievously wounded in the, in the calf. It says they, sh they shot him in the calf, and at the same time, um, as we'll, we'll see here later in the story, um, apparently Mr. Smith can't move, even though he's got another good leg on him. I don't know. Couldn't find much about this whole deal. Um, uh, so, you know, in the meantime, after, you know, he hits, hits far, kills him, but he's just, he's just throwing down some hate on him. Like, he, he's got the high ground, he knows where they're at, they can't see him, and he can just fire at will. Uh, but anyway, Carver, he now ships his fire over to Memphis and the other guys, and he hits, uh, Mr. Love, can't remember that guy, uh, first name, but Mr. Love, uh, should have called himself Doctor, hits him in the thigh, uh, but not just, not just in the thigh, he actually shot him in his pocket knife, uh, and this... This is where Mr. Mr. Love is going to have a really bad day. So, he gets shot right in the thigh, basically right through the front pocket where, where a pocket knife would sit. Uh, I'm envisioning an old case trapper type of knife. Um, bullet hits it, sends a whole bunch of metal fragments into this dude's uh, thigh. And, um, but he keeps, he goes on fighting. And then, uh, right around 6 p.m., it says, he fires two more shots. He goes, goes silent. And uh, these guys, with, uh, with pretty good reason, are uh, they're laying pretty low. At this point, they've got three of them shot. Uh, no, four of them shot at this point. You got, you got Smith in the leg. Oh, far, far got shot. Yeah, so there's three of them shot, four of them shot, and um, and they're just hunkered down. They're just like, uh, please, please don't shoot me. And they waited like a full hour, it said, before they came out. But six o'clock's when the last two shots rang out, and then it started to rain pretty heavily. Very convenient for these outlaws. So in the meantime, 
Uh, Sheriff's posse is all hunkered down because they just got their ass thoroughly whooped. They wounded two of them. Uh, but they really, they really got the coals poured to them. And, you know, they, they, they wait there about an hour. But they, uh, they finally collect themselves and they, they, they peek their head up. And in the meantime, all these outlaws, they, they hit the trail. Uh, and somehow, oh, Elsie, after he got shot twice, uh, Passed out twice. Uh, maybe killed the sheriff. Who knows? Probably not. But anyway, he's not in good shape. But somehow he manages. And old Sam Ketchum has got a really high break in his left arm. And uh, this is not going to end well for him. It was, it was a bad day for old Elsie Lay. It was a bad day for Mr. Love. It was a very bad day for the sheriff. And, uh, and it was a bad day for Sam Ketchum. Um, anyway, the next day, U.S. Marshal, uh, Mr. Creighton M. Foraker, uh, Four Acre Foraker, uh, he rides up into <coughs> Turkey Creek Canyon to survey what had happened, and he rides up on just an absolute bloodbath, uh, war zone, uh, says there was bloody splotches on the ground, um, in multitude, uh, I made that part up. But, um, I, going uh, going off the language of the times, I bet that's fairly accurate. Uh, a lot of bloody splotches. <clears throat> they had forty pounds of dynamite in a box, but they they left out of there in a hurry. Uh, but they left all their bed rolls. They left a couple slickers. Uh, and there was just. Empty cartridges everywhere. Brass. And uh, it says they use a, a 3040. I don't, I'm not familiar with that uh, that round. Some of you gun nuts. You're all gun nuts. I, I like guns, but I'm not a gun nut. So uh, I couldn't I couldn't really talk guns, get into detail with you. But so I've never heard of a 3040. But apparently they were everywhere. And then in particular where Mr. Carver was sitting there just raining hate down on the posse. There was 23 rounds altogether. Which is pretty good shooting. Pretty damn good shooting. He managed to... Uh, so there was seven people that rode out. And uh, only three of them came out of there unscathed. And you know who one was? Perfecto. Perfecto Cordoba. Cordoba. Yeah, with a B. Um, anyhow, like, they, they really got their shit kicked in. And, um, but doesn't really end there. They're riding out. Old Sam catch him. Like I said, he's wounded pretty bad, and he gets to where he can't even ride anymore. The pain's just too much. Uh, you know, they could always strap you to your saddle. And, um, but he must not quite been to the point of passing out. And it just had to have sucked really hard. So they left him at a... He said, just leave me leave me back. And he wanted them to leave him out there in just the middle of nowhere. But they they made it to a ranch house outside of uh, Ute, uh, Ute Creek. And uh, they left him there and they rode out. And uh, he gets captured a couple days later. And he gets transferred over to the prison in Santa Fe, and he ends up dying from gangrene from his shoulder injury. Uh, LZ Lay, he recovered. Uh, LZ Lay and uh, Will Carter, or Carver, they, uh, they ended up getting some medical attention in Elizabethtown, or Elizabeth, uh, New Mexico. And uh, Lay was captured about a month later. Uh, he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. Uh, but he got he got pardoned in 1906, so he served about seven years. And uh, he lived a pretty long life. He ended up living until 1934 before he died. Carver, he made it back to Texas. I don't know whatever came of him, but he made it back to Texas just in time to take a very famous photograph with the Wild Bunch. 
with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the the well known uh picture with uh with five of those those old uh those out al- old outlaws there and uh Mr. Will Carver would be the top left. And um but he made it back to Texas. Um I'm sure there's probably some information about what happened to him after that. Uh but I didn't go in that far. And then you know, as far as uh Mr. Love poor bastard, he's out there just to try to round up a, a bunch of train robbers. And he gets shot in the thigh, breaks his damn pocket knife, and the hell of it was, he must have been a rancher, uh, and he must uh, must have done a lot of his own work because that so that that particular pocket knife just so happened to be the same pocket knife he used to treat and then eventually skin. And I'm not sure what they did with the skin. Uh, probably just burn it, but back in those days, blackleg was a real big problem, and he had used that knife to skin a blackleg uh, dead calf. And in doing so, he gave himself blackleg. Uh, his leg swelled up bigger than shit, and uh, he died a slow, painful, miserable death. Because by the time they got him to the doctor, it was about 18 hours later. And at that point, the infection was set in so hard that there wasn't anything they could do. So I'm sure they gave him a bunch of laudanum uh, or opium and uh, and a bottle of whiskey. And I'm sure he took every bit of it and said, keep them coming. And then faded off into the distance. So um, that puts a, a really shitty, not even a real good twist in... Uh, plot twist but it puts a very predictable shitty bow on the story of the Ketchum gang and you know although Will Carver made it out alive and uh Elsie Lay made it out alive just barely and uh spent enough of his life in prison that I'm sure uh Robin Trains wasn't wasn't his thing anymore but they were the they were some of the last of the old west outlaws and uh hey they refused to to go down easy it was uh some crazy shit happened back that back in those days fellas it, uh and ladies uh now once again we'll end it with uh think about all of that uh either being in uh in that outlaw gang being in the posse or just being somebody who lived right around there uh, wondering when they're going to stop robbing trains and come rob you. Um, think about all that, and uh, all of a sudden, life today doesn't seem so bad. So, um, on a bright note, I'm Matt McKinley. Go follow me on all the social medias, Matt McKinley on Facebook, at MakerMac85 on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Show pages, Burning Daylight on Facebook and YouTube. At Move Your Ass Everywhere Else. And uh, make sure you go check out the website, burning-daylight.com. And uh, we got a lot of cool stuff over there. But uh, as always, uh, with these uh, crazy times, remember it could always be worse. So move your ass for Burning Daylight.